Hi everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this discussion about teaching methods in astronomy education. I'm super excited to be at least virtually with educators who are teaching astronomy to young people. Uh, before we start though, I must confess that I am not an astronomy educator. Uh, I am an educator and a researcher who is incidentally very passionate about astronomy. I currently work at MIT in a research group called Lifelong Kindergarten. Here, we study how people learn, and in particular, we study how people learn by creating, by developing activities and technologies that help them uh, learn uh, through what we call creative learning. For us, it's important that children learn by making projects that they are meaningful to them in a social environment and with a playful spirit. We sometimes summarize this approach uh, calling it the four P's of creative learning. There are four words that start with the letter P. Projects, passion, peers, and play. A big part of our work focuses on helping the children learn and express themselves uh, through coding, in particular through a programming language that we developed called Scratch that allows them to create anything like stories, uh, animations, or video games. But the creative learning approach that we promote is very general and I believe uh, can be applicable in a wide variety of uh, contexts. So today I'm going to try to uh, present and discuss how creative learning can be hopefully helpful in the context of astronomy education. In a nutshell, the four P's of creative learning describe four principles to create experiences that are active meaningful, social, and playful. Let's start with projects. When people learn, they're actively constructing knowledge in their mind. This process of constructing knowledge is particularly successful and also more enjoyable when it is associated with the process of constructing something in the world. It can be anything. It can be a physical object, it can be a story, it can be a theory of the universe. So, these assumptions have concrete implications in how we design experiences for students. As educators and designers, we ask ourselves, like, how can we engage students in active and creative learning process? Uh, what type of projects or activities can help them encounter some specific ideas or spark certain questions? I recently came across the work of Nicoletta Lanciano and Franco Lorenzoni. And they are educators from the Movimento di Cooperazione Educativa, MCE, in Italy. And over the last few decades, they've been developing wonderful activities for children to explore the sky and learn about astronomy in a very engaging way. In their books, they describe activities in which children are making direct observations and drawings, or they are manipulating and constructing physical tools, uh, or they are sharing and learning about myths and traditions from different cultures. All these activities allow students to encounter and generate new knowledge through concrete objects and direct experiences. Project-based learning is not a new thing in school. Actually, it's very popular. But too often, theory comes before practice. Children start by studying abstract concepts in books, for example, and then they can make a project to apply the theory or improve their understanding. But projects, experiments, activities are an opportunity for people to encounter new knowledge, to discover something that is new for them. So when children like carefully look at the sky to create the drawings or when they build astronomical tools or when they invent fictional stories, they're more likely to raise genuine questions and also to be more receptive and motivated to seek the answers like asking to the teachers or looking into books. Passion. When people are engaged in an activity that they find interesting and meaningful, they're more likely to work harder and persist in face of the challenges. Of course, different people have different interests and might be more or less curious about certain topics. As educators, it's very important for us to think about this question. Like, 
how can we increase opportunities for all children, for all backgrounds to be interested in science and astronomy? And how can we design activities that are accessible, engaging, and above all, inclusive for everyone? Once again, a good example for me comes from the work of Franco Lorenzoni, a primary school teacher who organizes the first night of school for his students. Students of different grades and their teachers get together a little outside of the city where it's dark enough uh, to observe the stars and planets and there they can uh, make observations, share stories and be together. It's not surprising that many kids love this type of activity and this experience can get them very curious about what is in the sky and how uh, things move uh, overnight. I was, and I am still, uh, one of those children who are extremely excited about space. And it's important though to understand that no, not all the kids are similarly attracted to what I love. And our passion as uh, educators is very important, but it's not automatically transferred to our students. Our design and facilitation of activities should take this into account and try as much as possible to create pathways into astronomy that are really for everyone. Peers. Learning flourish as a social activity as people are engaged in sharing ideas, collaborating on projects and building on each other's work. Learning together can take different forms, from big group discussions to small group collaborations or sharing feedback and remixing each other's ideas. In this type of collaborative peer-to-peer -peer environments, teachers are, have a very important role. They act as a facilitator and they actually play a wide variety of roles, like sometimes uh, guiding the exploration, other times responding to questions, other times are acting as connectors between students. So, as we think about peers, these are some questions that can come to mind. What type of activities can leverage the diversity of background and perspectives among the students? How do we structure the activity time and the group size and the roles and composition so that the students can get the most of the activity? And how can we create a healthy and cooperative environment for them to learn together? Last year, I participated as a student to an online workshop organized by Nicoletta Lanciano, Nestor Camino, who is here, and other amazing astronomy educators from all over the world. The workshop was named Incontriamo i Cieli del Mondo, which in Italian means like meeting the world's skies. And it involved participants joining from different continents and latitudes. And one of the activities that I loved uh, consisted in uh, uh, making observations of the moon every day at different times and then comparing our observations with those of other people from all over the world. This process allowed for like mind-blowing discoveries. Uh, for example, I realized for the first time that the moon uh, looks different at different latitudes and in the southern hemisphere it would look flipped, uh, you know, with respect to the way I saw it from the northern hemisphere. And again, uh, this type of findings uh, were only possible uh, because of collaboration and sharing knowledge and none of us could have like come across these discoveries alone. Uh, so as educators, as when we think about collaboration and peer learning, sometimes we only envision people working at the same project at the same time. But there are many ways to connect uh, people and knowledge. For example, one of my favorite ways of collaborating is what we call remix. Uh, that consists in like taking someone else's work on idea and keep expanding and working on it and sharing uh, sharing with, with everyone. This is actually also important because it gives children a taste of how knowledge is collectively generated and shared in a scientific community. And finally, play. 
The most engaging type of learning involves playful exploration and experimentation. Trying new things, tinkering with materials, testing boundaries, taking risks, and iterating over and over again. When we think about play in creative learning, rather than the activity, we refer to the playful spirit, the experimental attitude that we like to see uh, in students as they learn. As educators and designers, we can ask ourselves, what type of activities can engage students in iterative, exploratory, experimental type of learning? How can we create an environment in which students are more likely to try things out and to take intellectual risks? It might seem a little hard to imagine how to playfully experiment with astronomy. For example, some phenomena are only visible from some specific locations, and studying the movement of celestial bodies can require a very long time, a lot of patience, and also uh, a good weather. Uh, when direct observation is not possible, technology can help. For example, with softwares like Stellarium, Everyone can simulate the sky from anywhere on Earth at any specific time and make like also like the time flow faster or slower or zooming in on objects as you would do with a very powerful telescope. So it's definitely not fun as being outside and watching directly the sky, but these tools allow students to tinker with the sky, to change variables like time and location and see what happens. And there are also many stargazing mobile apps that allow people to recognize stars and planets by pointing their mobile phone at them. And that's also a very playful uh, way to get familiar with the sky. Even though technology can provide opportunities to tinker with astronomical knowledge and materials and ideas, cultivating a playful learning environment is something that only humans can do. Unfortunately, sometimes we hear sentences like you should know this already or this idea makes no sense. Instead, a good teacher always takes students' ideas and questions seriously and without judgment. They try to understand what are the underlying assumptions and use that as an opportunity to get new insights. And no matter how naive or uninformed a question might initially look like. So, this openness is crucial to create a playful culture. A culture in which everyone feels free to step forward, ask questions, and take intellectual risks. The four P's of creative learning might seem quite simple ideas, but the practice of designing and facilitating creative learning experiences is far from easy. Projects, passion, peers, play, they don't define a specific practice. They're not a method. They are guiding principles that can help us raise questions, challenge assumptions, and eventually shift our practices as educators. So someone might ask, why should I shift my own practice? We sometimes mention purpose as the fifth P of creative learning. Actually, purpose should come before all the other P's because it's related to the why we teach. And the why can guide how we teach. So, what is the purpose of astronomy education? Why should children learn about astronomy? And how does our purpose reflect into our teaching practice? Not all children will be astronomers or astrophysicists, but all of them are humans who constantly try to make sense of the world and their existence in it. As educators, we have the responsibility to share what we know about our planet, about the universe, but transmitting information can't and shouldn't be the only purpose of education. Cultivating students' curiosity and sense of wonder, helping them to think critically, enabling them to create and develop theories supported by evidence, that is at least as important as teaching them facts. In a time in which we are increasingly surrounded by a number of people supporting and promoting conspiracy fantasies like flat earth models, cultivating a combination of critical thinking and inquisitive wondering is more important than ever. I hope that the four P's of creative learning can help teachers and educators develop meaningful learning experiences for their students 
and help them grow as thoughtful and curious inhabitants of the universe. Thank you.